God make this not be just a message today. God make this the change that we all need. Now, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, God, but that's your word, so I'm claiming it right now. I'm claiming it. Jesus' first message, his first message recorded, that is uttered for us in Matthew's gospel, first order, repent. Now, we have many times over taken this English word and looked at it carefully from the Greek. I'll write it phonetically. And for our first-time visitors who don't know, the New Testament was not written in the King James English, nor in the NIV or the RSV or the NLT or any other acronymed, but it was written primarily, the bulk of it at least, in Greek. A few sayings of Jesus uttered out of his mouth that were not but the bulk of it, New Testament Greek. So this word that we have uh, taken to ourselves when we say the first message, repent, often carries with it the idea that we should, uh, where God meets us, we should be bawling and squalling and feeling miserable and sorrowful. But the Greek word makes it abundantly clear. This message simply, meta, with anoia, mind. Metanoia, with mind, to change, to turn from my way to God. And that is demonstrated if you are turning in your Bibles to the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. You read, and I will read from verses 12 through 22, and then I will focus in on my text because I do have one I'm going to use Matthew 4, 12. Now when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, that Greek word, metanoia. And he didn't say, if you'll consider repenting, it was an imperative command to the hearers to repent, to change your mind, to turn from your way to his way, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we read sometimes, and we read these words, and they they don't carry the same effect. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Out of the mouth of God, he says, the kingdom, that word right there should have had lights going off in people's mind. A kingdom suggests a king, and a king who has complete sovereignty over his subjects and his kingdom being come on earth but is in heaven, is at hand. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They straightway left their nets and followed him. Going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately left, they left the ship and their father and followed him. That whole picture of Jesus calling, calling these men to follow him is an unfolding of this one word in the Greek, metanoia. Not just simply, I changed my thought process, but I was going along my way, doing my thing, and now I'm going God's way. There's the, there's the unfolding of it right there. Now, I want us to focus on something with open hearts because this is not something, it dawned on me, while I'm asking you to help me, how can you possibly help me as a congregation when you haven't for 37 years, I checked. You have not been instructed in this. So now today you'll say, I have no excuse. 
Uh oh. Could you preach that message you had prepared last week? <laughs> nope. So, let's be clear about the first thing that Jesus says here. He says, Follow me. I want to start right there. And I've got abundant notes here. Each one of these seems quite important. So if I glance down, you'll know I'm looking at abundant notes I've made. Jesus does not say, follow me because of what you already are. Jesus does not say, follow me because in doing so, you'll be able to do what you would like to be or to do. But rather, he says, follow me, follow me, and I will make. And we're going to stop right there. Follow me, and I will make. Now, wrap your minds around this, because this is a church that has existed to teach and then in the promises of God, and you know many, many promises of God. So how is it that when the Lord speaks and gives a directive, we will not act upon it? Because we can rationalize in our minds, perhaps it means something else. Now, in following the Lord, does he save us? Yes. Does he cleanse us? Yes. Does he heal us? Yes. Does he make us part of the family of God? Yes. Does he sanctify us? Yes. Does he justify us? Yes. Does he do the reconciliation that Colossians talks about? Yes. Does he draw us to him? Yes. Does he transfer us from being orphans to being in the family of God? Yes. All of the things that you know to be true about the gospel message he does. But here he says, follow me with the intent of doing something with you fully aware that these men, as he called to them, he, A, found them in the streets where they were, in their natural places. He did not go and travel 50 or 100 miles from where they were, their, their place, their residence, their work. He found them there. I love this. And I want you to just dwell on some of these pieces I put together. He said to these men, follow me, and I will make something of you that you are not right now. You're fishers. Your trade is to fish, fish in the sea, but I'll make you fishers of men. Uneducated, unlearned, stinky, dirty, Galilean peasants, founders of the church of God, fathers of the faith, the onlooking church world today would say, we can't have that running the church, can we? Now listen, if you come from a funda fundamentalist background, you'll find me offensive. But all those who know that they need real salvation and a real message, you'll latch on and say, I like the real thing, because that fundamentalist stuff takes you nowhere except hellbound. It t keeps you bound up. <laughs> now, just to be popular here. <laughs> Galilean peasants are going to be the pillar and ground of truth. Oh, oh holy Jesus, help us. <laughs> but that's exactly what the Lord chose. I want you to see, because you and I are exactly the same as these Galilean peasants, and forgive the crude analogy, but unlearned in God's ways, unskilled, and probably very uneducated when it comes to the things of God, really to the deep things of God, and yet he says, these are the tools. Radio people, I just pointed to me, and I pointed to the people in front of me. These are the tools that I use. This is my utility cabinet over here, the large cabinet. The door is now open, and these are the vessels here, right here. Somebody might say, me? Oh, yes, and you. And I'll tell you what the beauty is. If you're reading this whole book, the whole counsel of God, you'll see something quite impressive. You remember back there in the Old Testament, Hannah, Samuel's mother, she prayed a prayer in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 8, and she said this. 
She said, he, he raises up the people from the dust and the beggars from the dunghill, and he sets them among princes. That is what the Lord is still doing today. He's still doing it, folks. Some almost now we're talking about a 2,000-year span between the time of Christ and our time, but still doing it today. So when I put these principles out there, don't say, well, how, how do you think I can be a part of this solution by understanding what God has called you to do? You know, I, I, I took last week and I prayed and I thought, you know, I bet you there's a lot of folks out there that are going to roll up their sleeves and say, I'm going to get to work and help Pastor Scott. And then it struck me. This was really my moment of illumination. I better make sure that in the helping, you are doing the same thing that I have committed to do, which is let the Lord lead. Don't go out and make a device that you think will be doing the Lord's work or helping him out because he doesn't need that. He just needs obedience. Oh, what a radical concept that is. So let me tell you what I'm talking about. In this text where Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, I want you to see how God has repeatedly done the same thing over and over again. You might ask me, how could God take chaos and calamity and darkness and with the fiat, just the speaking of his word, change your essential being? Well, you're much easier to change than the mess that he straightened out in Genesis 1. And there it says the world was void, darkness was upon the face of the earth, and just the speaking of let there be light, light essentially, light be and there was, just the declaration separated the light and the darkness. The twain, you might say, well, that's the day and the night, but in, in, in concept, the twain never met again. They're separated. God separated them. God divided them. Now, I know there'll be people that will say, okay, well, that's creation, though. No, that is, that is you and me, darkened souls, Darken until the illumination of God's word comes in. And this is my revelation. And you're going to say, oh, wow, pastor, that's a great revelation. Sarcastically, perhaps. But there are a lot of Christians. And be careful that you listen to what I'm saying, because if not, it'll be misconstrued. There are a lot of Christians calling themselves Christians, and that name, Christian, is a little Christ or follower of Christ who only in the name, they only carry the name, but the following principle is not there. They're not following Christ. They're following some man-made religion. They're not following and trying to be obedient to God's word. I'm not speaking of perfection, lest anyone misconstrue. I'm speaking of following Christ. Do you know what happens to a lot of churches today? It's pretty plain, I mean very plain. Man's doctrine has come in, and God's doctrine is gone, evaporated. Do you know why the church has absolutely or very little impact on the world today? Because the world has so much influence over the church. If you stop to think about that, the minute you turn on your television, and if you're offended by this, hey, I, I bat a thousand in offending people all the time. Turn on your television and listen to the doctrines of most, not all, but most. It's all a salve. It's all very soothing. It's all very pleasing. I challenge you. I challenge all of you. Go turn on your television and listen to something that has a religious banner and tell me who is preaching about hell. Tell me who is preaching about heaven. Tell me who is preaching week in and week out about concepts that are biblical foundational pillars that without that... A man simply holds a box and says he preaches the gospel, but when the box is open, there is nothing inside. It's just vapor. That's what Christianity has become. That's what it has become. Why do I say this so boldly? Because I believe that if the power of the gospel has the power, if the spoken word of God has the power that out of nothing everything came, 
I must not be too difficult in God's eyes because I'm not the universe. I may think I am periodically, but I'm not. And I make things really difficult for God because I have to keep frustrating what he's clearly told me. There isn't a more clear directive right here than follow me. If we stop right there and put a period, follow me. Now we will discuss what that means to follow. And I'd like you to know at first blush, some of you who have come in here with baggage will say, see, Pastor Scott, that's what I've been saying. You've been saying all the time that people can they don't make decisions to follow Christ. And I tell you, that's true because I believe in prevenient grace. I believe the initiative starts with God. And before I can ever, quote, unquote, decide for God, he has already decided about me according to the principles of Ephesians 1 that says I or you were chosen before the worlds were formed, called out for his purpose. Stop there for a minute. Have I even considered in this last week, and I'm asking you the same thing, his purpose? Or do I live my life calling myself a Christian because I can put the halo on everything I do, saying I serve the Lord Jesus, but really I'm just serving myself? Oh, harsh words. Oof. Okay, well, let's try this another way then. Follow me. That means I listen to his words, his teaching. His, by the way, his, not mine or another man's, his. He said, you are salt and you are light. And if, if we are indeed salt, it means we are placed in this world as salt, as a preservative in a putrefying, rotting world. But if the salt has lost its savor, it's to be thrown down and trodden underfoot, has no power, has no impact. This, is, this should be the message. That I wish we could go back and I could tell you, this is my first message ever delivered to you as VF1. Not VF1A, VF1. Because it is so desperately needed for us to get a check while we sit and we do. Come on, let's be real. I'm going, to, I'm going to be the first one to confess it. I'm the, I am the worst offender at sitting with my arms crossed and throwing eggs at other people in Christianity. I'm the worst offender at it. I confess to you. Oh, that you see that ministry over there? Do you see those people over there? you see that? But the reality is, who gives a rat about those people? Yes, I avoided it. <laughs> who, who cares about them? I'm concerned about you. And the closer that we try to follow him, not perfection, trusting his word, the more we want to press close into following him, we will be listening to his words and his teaching, and change will come. Change will come. Now, these men he called, these men I just read here, are four fishermen, he called them. We never think of them as fish. He called the fishermen, and they are the first fish of the church. Wow. Okay. So aside from that being a freak show, they are the first fish that he said, follow me. And make no mistake about this. While I watch people talk about these uh, ideas of the gospel net. You ever hear that expression? People say, throw out the gospel net. You ever hear that? Come on. Show me your hands. You ever hear that expression? The gospel net. The next evangelist that I hear say that, if I'm close by, you better hold my right. You better hold this back here because it's going to end up on somebody's chin. You'll always see this pattern. It's usually two or three Nut job sitting there talking about the gospel net being thrown out. It's time to throw out the gospel net. Jesus talks about these men who were by trade fishers mending their net, and in the type and in the example, the gospel. The gospel. Not anything that man can come up with. Now, we're going to throw out the gospel net. Will you recite the sinner's prayer for you? Good candidate, Brother Mike. <laughs> 
okay, we well, already know what a sinner you are. We don't want you to recite the prayer. <laughs> Think about that. It's always done this way. Throw out the gospel net. The first thing that's done is to lead people in the sinner's prayer. Well, if you're going to use the tactics of what's been laid out here, Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you something you are not. But the criteria is you must be following me. And if there's a net to be thrown out, it's the gospel message. Only the gospel message has the power to stop you right where you are. We really are like fish. I hate to admit it, but we really are. We're slippery. We know how to get out of that. (laughs) Just kind of move to the side and poof. I want you to think about these words I'm saying. Jesus said a directive for those who want to read the Greek. Dute, follow me, is one word. A verb in the imperative. Oh, the Baptists are going to love me. Aorist, active. Doesn't mean once saved, always saved. But the following concept is some event that happened in the past. That's prevenient grace that keeps me actively following. Baptists will say that means once saved, always saved. Don't listen. (laughs) One word, an imperative. I want you to think about all these things because it's needful then to understand that there is no other method by which men can become fishers of other men than by that process. If you ever heard people say they have a They have a uh, seminar to teach you how to witness to people. You ever ever hear those? You ever seen those advertised somewhere? Come on, this particular date, we'll we'll tell you how to do it. Hey, if you need to go somewhere to hear how to do it, rather than opening up this word and listening, reading to what Jesus said, why? Do you know why? Because then you don't need to do this. See? The, the preacher or the evangelist or whoever it is, nice writing, who says, you don't need this. I'll give you some techniques. Be sneaky. Be crafty. Carry big stick. <laughs> That'll hit you later. And maybe, and maybe it will. <laughs> Here's the problem. If you're not following him, I'll just say it colloquially, he he ain't going to do anything with you. Don't be foolish enough to think that what I'm asking you to do in helping me, now I am the under-shepherd placed here. Every church that says they have a pastor, that has a pastor, that pastor should be, if they are indeed, a gift from God, domata in the Greek, given for the perfecting of the saints, then then you follow me as I follow Christ. And your criteria of following me is Pastor Scott rightly dividing this word. That's your criteria. No other criteria. Not the package, not the makeup, or the hair, or the clothes, even the long pants. None of it. Am I opening up this word of God and instructing you so that you can follow me as I follow Christ? Any other doctrine? leads you down a road that is not following him. Is that legalism? Absolutely not. It's called the spirit of truth. You know, the spirit of truth is a tough thing to receive because it's the power to come in and that little something inside you will will tell you, this is not the right way, but rather, maybe this is uncomfortable. A minister of God, a responsible minister of God will stand and preach those unpopular truths because they're needful, because they're necessary, but more importantly, because Jesus instructed us to do this. There are a few things that are, there's no wiggle room in. This is one of them. Okay, I understand then that you're telling me I am to follow, and now I'm following you as you follow Christ. So you define, Pastor Scott, what this following means. Well, first, it means I am faithing I am faithing in him and his finished work. For those people that say, well, what? that's not even a word. That's right. Because the King James and other translations would say, I'm simply believing 
to follow him. And that's just that mental movement of the mind. Other parts of the body can be moved too. That is just a mental movement of the mind to something until you are acting on that word. Remember the definition here? Hmm, 37 years worth of it, folks. Faith is action. Action. Wait a minute, don't jump ahead of me. I, I like that. But, but some people haven't heard this before. Let's go slow. It's action. Action is what? Action is movement. Action, action is something. It's not, this is not action necessarily. Action based upon belief. Thank you. Belief, not just, not just any particular belief, but based upon a belief that is found in his word, sustained by the confidence, confidence that God will perform A, B, C. When we talk about what is faith, it is action based upon belief, sustained by confidence that God will perform his word, that when God says, I will, I will order your steps. I have called you. I will make you. I want you to hear this because this is the undercurrent of all this. I will make you something you cannot be of your own. The world has convinced us as a body that we're able to make changes in our life. And yes, you can make changes to the flesh. I, I know that firsthand. In fact, I was sitting and telling you about the changes to the flesh. Somebody said to me, the question was asked if I like beer, and I said, no, the only six-pack I carry around is on my tummy. <laughs> How many of you ever done sit-ups here? Show me a hand. Sit-ups? Sit-ups? Oh, she just reluctantly raised her hand. <laughs> and how many have actually seen the results of a sit-up? Repeated sit-ups, repeated. That's one over there, one. Just, okay, don't be bragging either. She, she held up her hand. And all the church looked at you like... My point is, most of us go through trying to fix the flesh... And most of the information we receive to fix the flesh is even erroneous. It's taken me all these years to figure out that I wasted so many years doing things that weren't profitable for the flesh, if we're going to talk about improving the flesh. It's taken me this long to actually listen to somebody tell me that all the things I was doing to try and keep the flesh were wrong. And only about six months to fix the problems that I gathered of a lifetime. Now, if I can wrap my mind around improving the flesh and working so hard at nothing, I can certainly work very hard at applying my mind to the spirit. We spend so much time wrestling this, this flesh pot that's just rotting anyway. That's, that's your prerogative to do whatever you want with the temple. Some people abuse it. Some people don't care about it. Some people deify it. But why waste so much energy there and not enough energy here looking at what he says. Follow me and I will make you. I'm going to do something that only I can do. So the following process begins with, I should have said before feeding, I should have said that the spirit draws. Somebody will say, well, see, you can just get up and follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, right? I have decided to follow Jesus. Wow, I'm surprised that most of you know that song. <laughs> You're not supposed to know that song. You left out the good part. No turning back, right? All right. Okay. Spirit draws. So the spirit must be operating in order for you to follow. That is provenient grace. You may have decided this morning, I'm going to start going back to church, but there was something spirit gnawing at you on the inside, and it wasn't my voice the whole week saying, you're either here or you're not. That was God operating. Spirit in you. Spirit draws you to follow, and the act of faithing. There's another act after this. That is the act of separation. And this is where people go down this path of looney tunes. 
It says that when Jesus called them, they straightway forsook their nets. They forsook their nets and the father that was in the boat, and they followed Jesus. And then everybody starts to think, that's the life I must live to follow Christ. Christ came to where they were, found them where they were, where they lived and breathed and had their being, spoke to them, follow me. Today he speaks to us like on this wise. Whatever you're doing, to the degree that you're doing it, start first with this concept of Forget about the English word repentance and go to the Greek word. Changing the mind, turning from my way to his way. That's the beginning of following. Three and a half years they followed Jesus. Did they, did they fish and catch any men for three and a half years? The answer is no. Well, see, Pastor Scott, the message doesn't work then. <laughs> no, the message works plenty well if you'll understand the steps that are laid out here. In fact, two things happen, separation and abiding. So, separation is not, well, now that I'm saved, sanctified, justified, righteousified, deliveredified, and everything elseified, I can't mix with your sinners anymore. See ya. I'm going to go with all the people over here that have been saved, sanctified, delivered, and holy. No. No. Separation is what Peter talks about in 1 Peter 3 when he says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Sanctify, separate, put aside. That is, your heart now belongs to him. We talk about the heart, but the understanding is in separating that place, that place, it says that you be ready to give an answer, apologia, from where we get our English word apology, to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that's within you. That's speaking of Christ. Now, we know this for a fact. To make this exercise a little less painful, separation in the Greek, we call that hagios. The separating, putting aside for the exclusive use of the deity. Simply saying... Once a person has begun the act of faithing, a mindset follows that says, God has separated me for his purpose. I'd ask you the question. It's a rhetorical one, so I'm not expecting an answer back, but why do you think that God just simply reached into time, into the stream of time, just merely to pluck you out and deliver you from the fire of hell and to not make use of you? Hmm. Interesting doctrine. All right. Separation, which is simply being set apart for his use. And you might say, well, Jesus called other people too. He called that tax collector. Oh, listen to me. Do you read anywhere in here, in this book, in this chronicle, the Gospels that record what I'm telling you right now, that during the three and a half years, other than Judas, we'll just kick him aside for a minute, other than Judas, do you read where these men, except for after Jesus' death, where they thought, he ain't ever coming back. We bet on the wrong horse. Feeling sorry for themselves. They went back to their trade. Peter said, I go a-fishing. I want you to think about this. Because for the better part of three and a half years, they didn't have, pardon the pun, they didn't have one foot in the boat and one foot on the dock like I did at one point in my life. They got in with Jesus and went. And it wasn't like, you know, I, 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 I'm part-time for Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm a part-time follower of Jesus. I'm part-time. I'm not a full-time follower yet. Follow me, they straightway forsook their nets. But it says here somewhere between those verses that they went back about every four or five days to kind of check on the nets, didn't they? First book of Scott. <laughs> they followed him for three and a half years. And to the very simple heart here, which is me, doesn't look like much change is taking place in these men. Doesn't look like they're doing too much learning. But they were doing something else during those three and a half years. They were abiding with Christ. You want to talk about what's behind follow me? When 
Jesus says to his disciples, and he speaks to the church yet today, follow me, faithing in his finished work, that he is who he said he was. That's settled by the resurrection, which a few Sundays from now, one or two from now, two from now, we'll talk about the proof that should settle some of those gray areas for some of you who've never heard the resurrection preached and taught. The evidence then is in your hands. But faithing in his completed work, separation, which is being set apart for his use, and abiding. These men for three and a half years had communion with the Lord Jesus every single day. And I'm not talking about communion, the wafer and the, the cracker and the cup. I'm talking about fellowship every day for three and a half years. You want to talk about following the Lord Jesus? You abide with him, and he abides with you. All of these are crammed into, because somebody might say, well, you just said, he said, follow me and I'll make you. So is it just enough for me to pick up this book and start walking and thinking I'm following Jesus, some guy down the street or anybody? It's got to be within his word. His word tells us the following activity, faithing, separation, abiding, There's something else too. Actually, there's a few more things, but I'll tell you at least one of them. Dependency on him. We sing a song, you can depend on Jesus. You can depend on Jesus, he's always there. That may just be a good song for some, or or it is your reality, that you depend on him to make his word true to you because he gave it. Like that disciple who loved Jesus so much, he laid his head on the bosom of Jesus depending on him for the comfort, depending on him for the wisdom, depending on him to do exactly what he said he'd do. Now, we being creatures of the flesh, we are impatient. We want to get her done, right? (laughs) See, Pastor Scott just talks the way it is, and you don't have to worry about it. I'm not interested in preaching this message, and you'll say, she spoke like this. I want this to be something you take away with you today. If we're going to solve this problem, it's got to be solved God's way. No more band-aids. We look at this word and we understand what it means. The following part, I think most of you have the following part down pat. I'm, I'm almost confident of that. Most of you have been faithing. That's beyond belief. That's the activity that is right there, hanging your whole entire being on what God said waiting for him to do, waiting for him to hasten and make his word come to pass. The separation, God use me for your purpose. Abiding in him, John 15, was our big place where we looked at all those words of abiding, where Jesus says, if you abide in me and I abide in you. This is how fruit comes forth. This is the fruit of the spirit that comes forth, and this is what it looks like. It's not fruit that's bought I used the analogy one time of fruit being bought at Vons and being hung on the tree, and then people say, see, my tree bore lots of fruit. The Christian does that. Most Christians like to hang the fruit that never grew on the tree. They just put it there, and it looks good for a little while, but it's not the natural fruit of the Spirit. If you don't abide in this Word, if you don't abide with Him, if you don't have fellowship with Him, I was talking to one of the staff lady, people on staff, a lady, and she was talking about how she hadn't really realized that she wasn't committing all the things in her life to him. And it dawned on me that same thought process of abiding, that every time we encounter something, are we acting like we're living with somebody because we were so quick to run to the flesh, pick up the phone and say, hey, I got to tell you this, but rather if we're abiding with him, the first person we talk to, the one abiding with us but there's nobody there. That's right. Just put the Bluetooth in your ear. (laughs) And then you and God can have a long conversation and no one will think you're crazy. Good advice from Pastor Scott. (laughs) Yeah. Do you see that? Do you see that man come out of the church today? He was standing on the street corner and he must have been venting on somebody. They're all going to blame me afterwards. 
Last one here, let's add it. To obey. Oh boy, Pastor Scott, I was doing good until you tossed that one in. Because that, that's harsh. Well, is this not an imperative? This very word I've given you in the Greek, follow me in the Greek, it may not appear as such in the English, but definitively and absolutely and unequivocally in the Greek, it is an imperative. Follow me. No, I'm not going to give you a second to think about it and make some decision because that's already been activated in your life. These didn't have to... hear any of these men say, Oh, let me pray about that, Brother Jesus. As he came by and said, follow me. Oh. <laughs> no? All right. They straightway forsook their nets and they went and they followed him. Obedience to his word is the toughest thing that we have to contend with. And I'll tell you why. Because... We live in a culture so motivated by the media. If the media tells this great story about don't eat this food, don't touch this, don't go in this area, don't swim in the ocean, don't look up in the sky. Oh, did you hear that report? We're not supposed to eat red meat anymore. Everybody stops eating red meat because the media gods reported it. Nobody eats meat for a month and everybody's back to eating meat including Oprah, nobody cares anymore. <laughs> oh, that, that was close. Whew. Now I'm being silly for a reason. Because how is it we're so able and apt to obey things that come from the world, but the very words that come from God come so difficult to our stubborn mule minds. And it's God talking, not Melissa Scott not Dr. Scott, not some other person. God is saying, follow me and I will make you. I put a period right there. Follow me, because I've explained that. I will make you. I will make you, period. I will make you. I will make you something you were not before. I will make you able to do things you could not do without me because the words of God without me, you can do nothing. I will make you do something that doesn't even resemble what you would naturally do. Well, sure, Pastor Scott, look at what's being said here. He says, I'll make you fishers of men, and that was pretty close to their trade. They'd understand that. Right. But it's even closer to us because we have this whole revelation in front of us telling us God is looking for something he gives us the opportunity to do. You say, well, you just said, follow me comes by the Spirit, calling, drawing, and then you follow. But then God gives a promise right here. I want you to see the promise. This word in the Greek, if I were just to take this one word, make, comes from, do you remember we studied in Ephesians, we are his workmanship? That word that we've so lifted up, poema, his poem, we are his poem. We are living epistles. Same word for I will make. That means God has the ability to rewrite what is wired in Melissa Scott's brain. God has the ability to remake, just like the message of the clay in the potter's hands. Why are we so willing to be that malleable clay for a minute or two? But here's a promise from God. He says, I will make you something you are not. Okay, I'm going to keep going on this. Is it getting hot in here or what? Maybe it's, maybe it's my opinion here, but I'm going to ask them to just uh, make it a little bit cooler in here because I'm getting hot. I think I'm melting like a wax candle. That was nice. All right. <laughs> he says, I will make you something you are not. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to look at myself and think, God took me and made me something I was not, with no training. With, there, there's nothing there that with any rhyme or reason, I fit right into the Galilean peasant category. And then I recognize I belong there. That's the stuff he uses most of the time. There's some anomalies of smart and educated people. I think those are the, the, real, the ones with the real diplomas, by the way, not the phony ones. 
Now, some guy on TV says he's got seven PhDs. Wow! <laughs> Impressive stuff, guys. Unless you've actually gone to a real university, and <laughs> then you really only need one. Yeah. All right. That was just gratuitous, by the way. So, Pastor Scott, why don't you tell us what you really think? I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> follow me most of the time. I'm speaking as you follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, you and I can do the math. Fishers of men. Let's go back to this idea somehow that if we're preaching God's word, that gospel message has the power to attract people. I'll give you the analogy. We've all had this happen here in Southern California, believe it or not, in this mini heat wave in the sanctuary, of um, having a power outage. Any of you were without power this last year? Yeah, I count for four. And guess what? In my residence, there are very few windows. So you depend on flashlights, and when the batteries run out of the flashlights, you go to candles. And then you find something very marvelous, because this is where the analogy becomes very important. The candle becomes the place, the room where you want to be in, where that small flickering light is. That's where you want to be. You don't want to go out into the darkness of the rest of the house where it's not illuminated, where you fumble around and by memory you try and figure out where is what, and you say, who put that counter there? But you want to be in the room where the candle is, where the light is shining. That's where you want to be until the power comes back on. And most people cannot grab hold of this concept. That's what we are like when we say lights in a dark place. This is the concept that is so hard for us to wrap our minds around that the process of all of this takes place and somehow we have become the lights in a dark place. Not, look at me, look at how bright I am. That's a lot of Christianity. Pruning and look, walking around like peacocks with the feathers fanned out. Most of the time you can only see them from behind. <laughs> but rather, I'm glad you liked that one. I liked it too. <laughs> but rather, being a light in a dark world means people will be who are in the darkness will be gravitated to come towards the light. If they have any inclination or desire, they'll come towards you. They'll come towards you, not understanding why they're drawn to you, but they'll come towards you. There's something about your person, which, by the way, isn't you, ha, 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 but don't tell them that right away. <laughs> Keep them fooled for a little while. But it's not you that they're attracted to. It's God, it's Christ in you. That's the light right there. So when people have said to me, well, how do I go out and do the fishing? How do I do this? How do I do this? What do I tell people? You can actually see the starting point is backwards. You have nothing to say. The starting point is you are to be your natural selves. If the light is in you, you cannot hide that light and put it under some bush or some chair where it's not going to at least radiate and be seen. Eventually, it will be lifted up high. And that which Jesus said was spoken in the ear. He says, you go on the rooftop to proclaim it. Now, somebody will take my words literally and will find some guy on his rooftop saying, Pastor Scott said, follow me. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I'm trying to give you the idea because even Dr. Scott, in his very early days, he used to chide and say, I'm going to write a book so winning ain't easy. You remember that? Oh, bless his heart. But I don't want to win your soul. I want God to touch your soul. I want you to be so gripped and possessed by something that only God can place in you that wild horses couldn't keep you from coming in that door every Sunday and from honoring your faithful commitment during the week in your houses, what you do in your home for your family, for your wives, for your husbands, for your children, to exactly that. That's my prayer, that you be... I can't win anything. I can't even win the lottery. <laughs> 
People talk about soul winning. I want you to get out of the mindset that somehow you are going to have to do something weird. Look at these men and look at them closely and study their lives and you'll find what Jesus was saying. They took in the teaching for three and a half years. They followed. They followed outside of their normal setting and this is the most miraculous thing. Do you remember in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, when it says they were out all night fishing and they caught nothing? You remember that passage? And Jesus says, cast out your net again. But Jesus, we've been out all night. Then he comes to his senses and says, nevertheless, at thy word. And he put out the net and there was so much that was brought up, they needed to bring over the other ship to put the abundance. The, both ships, both vessels were about to sink for the abundance. It only took obedience to God's word to do what he said, no more, no less. Most people can be probably messing up God's plan because they don't read, follow me with these steps. They think, if I can go out and do something. But Jesus says, if you go beyond me, if you try and go around me, or if you toil too far behind me, you'll toil all night and in vain. But rather, if you follow me, now something happened to these men, but not immediately. They had this teacher with them who taught them for three and a half years, and then he's dead. The announcement that he's dead, the end of John's gospel, what does Peter say? I go a fishing. It goes back to his old trade, his old vocation of going to fish something he knew. I think it's kind of awkward that that is a depiction of us. When we fail, we go back to the thing that's closest and most flesh related of what we can do. But rather, the number of fish that was caught on that day, even, when it says they caught 103, 153 fish that day. I believe is relevant. There's something to say that the act of putting down and taking up with the net that Jesus has provided, not of our own doing, will provide a specific number. I can't say what it is, but it is that number that God intends to fill the void in heaven that was emptied by Satan's being lifted up in pride and the, the casting down his, his self to the earth. There is a number, I don't know what it is, but when that number is reached, and when that number is reached, I don't know, I'm not God. We have a calling. Now why is it we take the words that come before, repent, and we take them to ourselves and say, yes, I understand, that's what the Christian must do, that's the point of departure, but we won't listen to the rest. Follow me, a word from the Lord, and I'll make you something you are not now. I will make you something. Three and a half years. And what is the promise in Acts? It says he told them to go tarry at Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father. And when that day came, the day of Pentecost, and the Spirit fell on that room and those people, the church was birthed in that day. And many people say, well, how do I get that? What do I do to do that? Well, let's go back to the beginning. Follow. Faith. Faithing in Him and His Word. Separation. That is simply, you know now you have been put aside for His use. You have a purpose. You have a calling in your life. This isn't just, I come and fill me up, Lord. I lift, I lift my own cup up for you to fill me, Lord. And I consume it on myself. <laughs> yes, I just changed the words to that song. Abiding in Him and obeying his word. Oh, here it comes. So you mean, I can go out and do all of this? Not necessarily, but if you're following God, you can. Let me tell you what it means in fishing language. Uh-oh, a woman's going to talk about fishing. Uh-oh. Yeah, but I got, I got taught by a good teacher, so it's okay. Bless Dr. Scott, he, he asked me if I'd ever fish, and I said, no, but I'd love to go and try. Of course, that was a lie. <laughs> the things you will do or say for people you love, I'd love to go. It sounds awesome. <laughs> so, go 
good. He said, I'm going to teach you how to fly a fish. And I thought, oh, how delightful. I, I envisioned what that must be, but it didn't matter because, hey, it's going to be fun. Little did I know that I'd be standing there for, what, an hour, two hours. And my arm's really hurting by this point. My wrist feels like it's going to come out of the socket. And I didn't catch anything. Well, maybe a cold, but that was about it. So we decided fly fishing wasn't for me. And we decided we'd try some other way. So we, we actually got this small boat. I don't know if you remember that lake we went on. Oh, boy. So, <clears throat> well, he did most of the fishing, but I did some too. And this water was so dark and murky, you couldn't see anything. And I'm thinking, how are you supposed to see? It's supposedly a stocked lake. How are you supposed to see if there's any fish in this lake? Because it could just be you paid to fish in a lake that says it's stocked, but there's no fish in here because you can't see the bottom. And I just stressed over that the whole time. Where are the fish? <laughs> OK, we caught one fish after being out there for five hours. <laughs> five. <laughs> and I, you've got to love Dr. Scott for this. He, he takes the fish out, and the fish is moving around. It's not that big of a fish. He says, take it off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Fish are very slippery because that five hours of work slipped out of my hand in a second. <laughs> now, take all of that funny story and make the application because I have watched probably multiple days and day in and day out fishers come and go from that very place. And every single day, in fact, they get up real early when the water's nice and placid. And somehow, whether they can know by the sky or whatever it is, they're out there fishing, and they'll catch one or two fish. They'll catch something. And if they don't, they're back the next day. And they're back the next day because it's Obamacare. So they're back the next day. <laughs> and they're back the next day. <laughs> Oops, sorry. the tenacity to keep going back. Now, if a man went out to fish and called himself a fisher, fisherman, just fish, plain fish, any kind of fish, and never caught a fish, but he called himself a fisherman, we might all say, yeah, hmm. OK, Charlie here has gone out for 20 years. He's got all the dress and everything going on. He goes out to fish, and he never catches anything. Maybe we should tell him to give it up. Fishing is not for him. But that's not the way God works. He says, I'll make you be able to do something you are naturally not able to do on your own. And we're no longer talking about fishing. We're talking about the act of what is being addressed here. I want you to put all this in perspective because while we like to make a lot of excuses for why not, when it is God's order to us, it's an imperative. Now, some may say, well, I don't like that. Well, let me take the example a little bit further because it can be pushed just a little bit further than this. You take most of the people who are serious about fishing, and they'll go into cold and very deep water where you cannot see fish. I know I was in Anguilla, in that very shallow water where giant schools of fishes come along and scare the liver out of you, but they're very beautiful. It's like a ballet. They're moving this way and that way, and you can see them. But in these particular waters where Dr. Scott took me, you cannot see the bottom. And you have to have the faith, even as a fisherman, the act of putting something out there that at some point you will catch something. Now, here is where this breaks down and falls apart. We are not going out to do something on our own. You use any other tool, like these people who have seminars on how to bring people into the church and how to win them to Christ, and actually what you're winning is a lot of hot air because they may come into the church but they are not being grabbed by the power of the gospel that has the power to change and transform that nothing else does. Not good, soothing words. I know what the church has become. I know what the church has become. It has become a place where people want soothing, comforting words. Pastor Scott, preach a message where when I leave, I feel tingly and good and warm all over. Well, that could happen one of these days. But right now, I'm telling you, here's an order and a charge. And if you're preaching the whole counsel of God, we're going to look at the whole thing. It should make you feel warm to know that I have and you have a commission and a charge from God. 
Now, how to? How to? How do I do this thing? Well, let me give you an example straight out of the scriptures because that's the best thing. It speaks for itself. In abiding, faithing, obeying, being separated, all of these things, in the book of Acts, it speaks of Philip in the 8th chapter, I believe, speaks of Philip. It says, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and said to him, join yourself to that chariot. You know, either you read the Bible and you think it's a caricature or it's for real. I don't think it's a caricature. I think people were moved by the Spirit of God and can still be moved today by the Spirit of God. Go join yourself to that chariot. And that chariot just happened to be taking a man who had many questions and basically with with this scroll or book, he says, do you understand any of this? Hey, you over there, you understand any of this over here? I just said, 1 Peter 3, looking for the opportunity to give a reason. And that's exactly what Philip did. He expounded the meaning that this man could not understand. And just as quickly as he expounded it, he was gone, disappeared, raptured to some other side of the desert. Well, will that happen to me? Well, <laughs> listen, I don't want to be telling you that because I don't know what God will do for you. Please don't pray that prayer. Lord, use me like Philip. Uh, <laughs> there be a lot of people disappearing around here. But let me give you the flip side because it's to show you that God has a way if we'll quit trying to bring our, our human doctrine into it, our human ideology. God has a way. It's his work. I give you the, the opposite side of the equation, which is Jonah. The Lord spoke to him. The Lord spoke to Jonah and said, Go to Nineveh. Cry against that city. What's the first thing that, even though he had an assignment, this is where you and I have a lot in common, and Jonah too, because he decided to go the other way. It was much easier to go the other way than it was to be obedient to God's word. It's much easier to say, Somebody else will solve this problem, Pastor. But you know what? There isn't going to be a somebody else because there's never going to be another you. God didn't raise you up and bring you to this place for you to act like somebody else is going to do it. Now, this shocks a lot of people. But I believe I am a servant. I'm not above servitude. I'm a servant. And in that servant's role, I do understand. God will ask of me through his word, He'll ask of me things that I know as, as just as in a human frame, I am not capable of doing. But I know because he's asked it through his word. He says, I will make you do something, Melissa Scott, that you've never done before. Preach every Sunday. Preach my word every Sunday. And I'll make you, Melissa Scott, a conduit that you will do exactly what I have done, just as Jesus called his disciples and they were fish that miraculously became fishers of men. So we, exactly the same way. I don't know why when we come to this place, we somehow think, well, that doesn't apply to me. I want to put up all the defenses. It's not me. Now, I can tell you what will not work. If you decide tomorrow... By golly, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to help Pastor Scott rebuild the church and you decide to do it your way. It's not going to work. You may encounter people, but that lasting grip that God can use and place through you like an electrical cord because of your faith is not walking up to somebody and saying, Sir, can I ask you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you interested in learning about Jesus? Right? Because if you are, come, we'll, we'll pray together and we'll say the sinner's prayer and, and then you're saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now go find a church and be happy. <laughs> Do you read that anywhere in the Bible? Because my Bible does not describe that at all. My Bible has no description of that. None whatsoever. I just read plain and simply. In fact, do you see the words of Jesus where he says, you sinners, fishermen, sinners, Quit your vocation as sinful men. Well, you might say that in another way down the road, like why are you sleeping when you should be watching, or some other way. I don't read it. The example is right here. 
I so desperately, I don't want this to be a talk today. I want this to be the engrafting. Do you remember Dr. Scott used to talk about the walnut trees driving up north? He used to talk about those engrafted English walnut to the black walnut tree. The engrafting of those trees that then grew together. I want this to be the engraftation of God's word today that will take hold of you that you'll say, you know, she's right. That is what God's word declares. Not only that, but I've been trying to go out there and figure out how to come up with some scheme or come up with some plan. But rather, just naturally, this is the way the Lord works. He takes us right in our environment. He doesn't ask us to put on crazy errors and questions. And anything that is not part of this book becomes man's doctrine. This is what has killed the church. I said it, it bears repeating. The church of Jesus Christ, the church of God, has so little influence on the world because the world has so much influence over the church. No one is interested in what saith the word of God. What is God speaking to us today? And today, today if we'll hear this word and say, God, I'm not there yet, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be following you. I'm going to be following Pastor Scott as she follows Christ with these pegs that I have put forth with an understanding that this is his promise. He didn't say, I'm going to give you some task that you're not able to do. They waited on the day of Pentecost. I've told you a thousand times, I don't care what any other Pentecostal, charismatic, or any other Azics or Maddox say. Yes, that was close. <laughs> the Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost to equip those men and women who were there in that room to equip them for service. It wasn't given as a gift to be kicked around and flipped on and off like a light switch, like some would have you believe. It was given to equip for service. God does not dispense his things willy-nilly and decide, you play around with it for a while and see if it works for you. But rather, this is what I have promised, the promise of the Father to give you a comforter, to give you one to come alongside, to guide you in all wisdom and truth with that spirit flowing through you, you become like that candle in the room I described in a power outage. People will gravitate towards you naturally. When you start to really believe that and recognize that is the gift in you, you will watch people around you gravitate towards you. Now, I'm gonna, I, I, I do not believe in preaching experience to you, friends, but I will tell you, the Lord blessed me in the last few weeks last few months to meet a very, very kind lady who I don't listen, I don't really know her background and I'm right at this point not asking questions. All I know is that the people around her have all remarked, because I've been talking to her and had lots of fellowship time with her, that people have said, including her husband and some friends that know her well, something has changed about you. Something is different. Something that is full of joy and full of energy, but no one can describe it. And I just... It was reported to me, and I just smiled and said, see, I'm privy to see God's grace working in somebody's life. That's the greatest blessing, see God's grace working in somebody's life before they even know it. And I look at that, and I say, that's what God did for me, and he does it for each one of us. I haven't taken this person and said, now get on your knees and pray and accept Jesus. <laughs> but rather, I've left it in such a state that this person now asks questions and desires to know. And little by little, I believe that this will become a, a mounting force that at some point, it is inevitable. That is, that is the dunamis of God. It is inevitable. You cannot contain it. So when I ask you, you are the family of God. When I ask you to help me, it's not help Melissa Scott. Listen to the voice of the sayer and run to his voice, take his words. If nothing else, meditate and pray on the fact that he has not finished making something of you. He's not done. And just because you went out one time and somebody said, you're a nut and you're a lunatic, join the club, you'll be hated without a cause. Do you know how many people hate me? And they hate me and they've never even met me. In fact, I want to I wanna gloat a little bit. Can I have one more minute of your time? <laughs> Just one more minute. 
I shouldn't do this because that person's probably listening right now, but hallelujah. Hey, <laughs> love you. All right. <laughs> There's some guys trashing me up there in Northern California, saying all kinds of wise, crazy, crazy stuff, right? And I get this report on Friday. I said, we'll deal with it on Monday. But I got the guy's number. I never met this person before. So I decided to call him on the phone. <laughs> and, and, and I got Bible for that. Because the Bible says if you have something against somebody, you talk to them. You don't go gossiping and spreading trash. You talk to them. So I called this brother on the phone. <laughs> Yo, we're brothers. I called this brother on the phone. And I said... It has been reported to me that all you have been doing is talking trash about me, and I don't like it. So now I'd like you to tell me where you got this information from, because this is what my Bible tells me to do. I thought it was the beginning of Barbara Ann, actually. It's da, da, da. That's what it sounded like. In Christian love, of course. If you're going to be a Christian, friends, be a Christian. If you're going to live your life for Christ, then take every remnant of a, a true promise. This one is mine and it's yours. I will make you something you are not. I have license to stand on this and say, okay, Jesus, I'm, I'm doing all these things. I'm faithing, I'm abiding, I'm obeying, I'm separating myself because you've separated me now. I'm going to stay on that promise that you're going to make me something I'm not. This can be applied to everything in your life, not just to be fishers of men. This can be applied to everything and anything in your life because he said so. He gave his word. I stand on that word with the knowledge that the same power, the exact same power that raised him up from the dead, that rolled away the stone, not so he could come out, but so we could come in as people, as humans, and look and see that he wasn't there dwells in me and dwells in you. And for that, and that alone, I want to draw close. I want to draw close. Is there any shame? Can anyone tell me here, is there any shame in wanting to follow closer after God's heart? Is there any shame in that? I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to ask you to do likewise. So I don't want today to be, I delivered a message and we leave here and we say, woohoo. I want you to leave here today saying, you know, I hadn't really meditated on that. I just thought that was for those men. But then if that's the case, repenting would only be for those men. And all the other things that Jesus said would only be for those men. It'd be a doctrine for somebody else and not for you. He said, preach my word, and it's his. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, keep teaching the doctrine you have received. Not your doctrine, Timothy. His. As long as we keep him in sight, he will enable. He will make this, not a band-aid, friends. He will make this the solution for this church where we stand on that word. And week after week, like those fishermen that go out into those waters who cannot see, but yet they call themselves fishermen, with faith, faith and tenacity to keep going out, with the courage to believe God will, because of these words, action, I'm taking that, based upon a belief I've heard and read it. I'm acting with confidence. He said it. He'll make it happen. The change may not be like this genie in a bottle and voila, here we go. But you start believing that he's going to make you into something for his purpose and it will begin to be. That's what my Bible says. Ask and it will begin to be generated unto you. That's been grossly abused by people preaching erroneous doctrines. But when it comes to his word, he's faithful to perform it. My message to you today is his message. If you will believe with me and you will faith with me, he will make you, he will make you fishers of men, not ideas of how to. He'll make you in the most natural state as light and as salt and as brilliant shining emblems of what we will be because it is not revealed yet what we will be, but only in part. I'm liking the little part, but I'm asking God I'd like to see a little bit more of you and less of me. My prayer for you is not a sermon. It's action today, action on his word. He said, follow me. I'm asking you to follow me as I follow Christ, that he will make us something. We are not yet, but we're on our way. 
We're on our way, the beginning of which starts right now. That's my message. Please, don't make this a sermon. Make this your life. I love this church. I love reading your messages, the ones that come in the mail, the ones that come over the phone lines. I love that I'm honored to be a steward for this church as long as I have breath. Please don't take it for granted. Don't take God for granted. You don't know what tomorrow or this afternoon holds. We only know what we have right now in the now, what God has given us. And the eyes to look for what may be. But in the process, when you start to just take that complacent, somebody else will do it, it's not my problem. It's not just disrespect to God's house. It's disrespect to God. Now, you may not think so, but that's the way I took it. I'm glad you're all here. I'm believing that you will take the message today and let it take root in you, that we will be changed as a church, and that by God's power, nothing that I have given you today, but God's word, through his spirit, he will make us something we are not right now, but he will because he said so. I'm going to stand firm on that for you and for me. Good day, folks. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.